that is getting very crispy. All right. Yay for old dish towels. Let's do another quick cut test. Oh. It's like butter. And now we're really going to sharpen it. But before we do that, one more quick little bit of lecture. The rest, the rest of this is, I'm pretty much going to show. This little stone is what's called a nagura. And basically what that translates to is it's a cleaning stone. It's a, it's a fixing stone for larger whetstones, specifically Japanese whetstones. And you can see all this residue here from this. And, um, the black is not yet oxidized carbon steel dust, basically. But you see this uh, rusty tinge. That is uh, particles of metal that are already rusting into the surfaces, surface of this wetstone. So what the Nagara does is to clean all that. It cleans the surface of the stone, levels out any little tiny scratches and imperfections, and gets it all clean and pretty and ready for the next person. It does a little bit of flattening. It's done properly. However, it's no substitute for the use of an actual flattening, flapping plate or flattening stone, which is needed for all what's known periodically. Now, there are two different but related types of little stones. Just a little round the edges over just a little bit. All right, so put the rinse on this, and you can see that it is now nice and clean, ready for ready to use next time. The difference between I'm gonna set this aside. A nagura or fixing stone is to be used after sharpening to clean and refresh the surface of your whetstone. A dressing stone is similar but is used prior to sharpening to prepare the surface of the stone to receive the blade and also to help begin getting a slurry going. So dressing, you would not want to use a nagura as a dressing stone because the nagura has coarser particles than the whetstone. And if you use the nagura on the whetstone prior to sharpening and then go and sharpen without rinsing the stone off, you are actually sharpening at a coarser grit than your whetstone, which kind of defeats the purpose. Unless that's what you want. Unless you want to use a thousand grit as a 600 grit, then by all means go ahead. All right. I'm gonna, I know I keep saying I'm gonna shut up, but I don't. What can I say? I'm a nerd. It's what happens when you let nerds do things they're nerdy about. They tend to never shut up. But I'm going to make it a goal now to do minimal talking through the next stages of sharpening. So this is 3,000 on this side, 8,000 on this side. We're going to start on three. I'm going to put this in the stone holder. All kinds of neat sounds. Now this is flattening stone, and this stone's pretty flat, but it's got a little residue from the last shard. So we're just going to get rid of that, give ourselves a nice clean surface, rinse that off, we're ready to go. I'll do the same with the 8000 grit. 
when I get to it. Had some excess coarse grits on there from my rinse wire. Got to get rid of that. Sorry, Garfield.
Almost done. I'm going to have some hand polishing work to do to get rid of a few of the scuffs and other byproducts of 
having grown on a blade for an hour and a half plus. All right, it's pretty sharp. Now let's drop it and see what real sharpness is. I'm going to get rid of this whetstone, dry this counter off. Someday I'll set up a sharpening pond of some sort so that sharpening doesn't make a mess in my kitchen. However, factory made designer sharpening ponds are immensely expensive. Imagine paying somewhere in the range of $250 just for a, a basically a little basin that sits on your countertop and, and you put your whetstone holder on it just to catch water. I think I'll use a uh, plastic bucket and rig up a cheap sink fridge because that's how I roll. I'm not paying, if I'm going to pay $250 for something, I'd rather buy a beautiful new knife or some kind of premium whetstone. All right. So I'm going to do, this is my suede side of my strap loaded with some 14,000 grit fine hooning compound. And this will polish and clean any little lingering bits of micro material left at the edge from the wet stain. Really refine it, refine the edge. I usually start out like this. I just, especially with a long blade, just make sure the whole blade really gets worked over nicely. Believe it or not, plain leather has. One of the features of the protein matrix of plain leather is that it will actually abrade steel. And so the polishing compound merely speeds up that process. All right, after that has been done, then I do some of the same type strokes that I did on the whetstone. Nice long strokes. Be careful on that side. I'm going to whack the tip of the knife into the counter, undo all my hard work. There's really no way to overstate how beneficial it is to have a good strop. I think you know, rubbing the knife on a piece of leather, what's that going to do? Oh, it does a lot. All right. I have some. I have a little bit of scuffing to polish and uh, some other odds and ends here. It's very hard, especially with a thick knife. It's very hard to grind on it for close to two hours without getting an errant scuff here or there. Especially when you're working with spending most of that time on, on very coarse whetstones. <clears throat> Even if you don't make a mistake in your motions, little blobs of slurry will build up and you run your knife through them and they'll mark up the side of the plate a little bit. All right.
This is uh, let's see it here. Let's see. Let get a little where it's reflective a little bit. Edges very mirror-like now. Perhaps, perhaps that works, and you can kind of see it. There you go. <clears throat> new camera angle, new challenges in selfie cinematography. So this should be very sharp now. So let's find out. <clears throat> Who are we cutting now? Let's see. Dilbert, Ardo, and Janice, the Argyle sweater, and Stone Soup. Apologies to all of those fine cartoon artists for what I'm about to do. So now that we're done looking at the counter, let's do this there. Hey. Now you don't really want to see the underside of my cabinet either. That'll work. All right. First time I've seen you on the wall. time for this. Those of you who stuck through this entire process with me, thank you. I hope that you enjoyed it and also that this little bit of paper cutting provides some sort of a reward for your patience, which is quite impressive. Mm. What a nice sound. So clean. This knife is so sharp. Let's do a double. There we go. Heel to tip, this thing is just razor sharp. I can't wait to cut some food with it. So the plan, oh, Costa grain too, look at that, just magnificent. I'd pat myself on the back, but I have a sharp knife in my hand. It'd be a very bad idea. All right, so the plan is I have another vintage American chef's knife very similar to this one coming in the mail tomorrow. It'll be Monday the 5th. Today is October 4th. And um, I'm going to leave that one as is. I have no idea what the condition of the edge of the blade is on that one. But I'm going to leave it as is and uh, we're going to do some food prep uh, using the two knives side by side one completely restored and sharpened, and the other completely unaltered, straight off shopgoodwill.com, where I bought it at auction. And uh, we will put the two knives up uh, next to each other. So two uh, very similar American-made 14-inch carbon steel chef's knives from the same era, one fully restored and sharpened, the other untouched, and we'll have some fun, and then maybe we'll cook. Who knows? Anything can happen around here. All right. Thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time with two of these giant knives in hand. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.